Welcome to Clarity in a Messy World, the podcast that looks at the causes behind the most confounding issues of our time. I'm David Wayne Callahan. In every episode, I'll be speaking with experts who will share their knowledge and insights and help us to untangle a seemingly chaotic world. Clarity in a Messy World is a production of Bocconi University Milan in collaboration with the Bocconi Student Media Center. When we look at poverty and inequality in the world, we often feel the urge to do something right now. But while action is vital, sometimes we could achieve more by taking a step back. What if we tried instead to fight poverty as a scientist would? Joining us today is Professor Eliana La Ferrara. Eliana holds the Fondazione Romeo ed Enrica Invernizzi Chair in Development Economics at Bocconi University. She's also Scientific Director of LEAP, the Bocconi Laboratory for Effective Anti-Poverty Policies. She earned her PhD at Harvard and, in 2020, was honored with the Bergit Grodel Award, presented biannually by the European Economic Association to a female economist who's made significant contributions to the profession. Eliana, thanks for being with us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Development economics took center stage back in 2019 when the Nobel Prize was given to three development economic scholars for their experimental approach to alleviating global poverty. Those scholars were Abhijit Banerjee, Michael Kramer, and Esther Duflo. And worth noting, Esther was the youngest ever and only the second ever female economics laureate. Can you tell us how their approach works and if it has produced any quantifiable change? Sure. So the idea underlying this approach is to apply in social sciences what uh, medical researchers have applied in their own work uh, for many, many years. That is an experimental approach. So think about uh, what we do when we try to see if a drug is effective. We enroll a number of patients in a clinical trial, and then we randomly select uh, a subset of these patients who's going to get the drug and another subset who's going to get a placebo. And we follow up with them to see if the patients that receive the drugs are doing better over time. So in social science, what you do is similar. You have a, an idea, an intervention that you want to try out because you think it's going to alleviate poverty. And instead of applying it across the board, you select a number of people or a number of villages at random from a, an otherwise similar population. And in these villages, you go and implement your intervention. And in another group of villages, you simply collect data, you do nothing. Afterwards, you go and you measure whether the villages where you've gone in with the program are doing better in terms of you know, economic and social well-being than the others where you haven't done anything. And if they have, you can be sure that this is due to your program. Why can you be sure? Because the fact that you picked at random who was going to receive the program and who wasn't means that there's no systematic difference between the two groups before you start the program. Okay, So they're fully comparable. Mm -hmm. And this is really a strength because it allows you to isolate the effect uh, of what you do. And uh, you asked me if this had produced quantifiable changes, uh, quite a few. Uh, so for many years, almost two decades now, researchers have partnered with policymakers to try and rigorously evaluate how different interventions uh, work and uh, uh, very striking findings and very important policy changes have been generated by the knowledge that we accumulated. 
for example, in the area of education, about how to tackle, uh, you know, people who are lagging behind, uh, how to leverage uh, local teachers uh, uh, in the area of health, about how to induce uh, service providers uh, to uh, exert more effort and, pro- and give higher quality services and so on. So there's a lot of examples nowadays of how this impact evaluation has then led policymakers, governments, NGO to adjust their programs to make them more effective. And has this approach since become universal or is it still the purview of only a group of scholars? Universal is a big word. Uh, I wouldn't say every single development economist uh, uh, is doing research or is adopting this approach, but uh, this is extremely widespread now. Uh, The researchers who got the Nobel Prize last year have set up a research lab called Poverty Action Lab, or JPAL in short, uh, which has offices around the world and that affiliates over 220 top researchers. And uh, what this, uh, you know, network of researchers does is really uh, partner with uh, local actors, as I said, NGOs or governments, uh, international organizations, to combine research and policy. So it is extremely um, widely adopted nowadays, uh, not certainly the purview of a small group, but uh, there is a plurality of uh, approaches still, and there are people who do excellent uh, uh, applied work not using experiments or not using randomized control trials, RCTs, which is uh, how the, these interventions are called. It sounds very intelligent, but the need to randomize leaves up to chance which group will benefit from a proposed program or intervention and who will be left without as part of a control group. As everyone involved here is disadvantaged, there seems to be an inherent injustice in that approach. No, I mean, I I hope they go back and give the proven benefits to the receivers of the placebo. Yeah, so this is an excellent point and actually one of the key challenges uh, of the RCT movement, if you wish, uh, that is the ethics of what is being done. So Mm -hmm. I think the way this is conceptualized uh, is the following. In many instances, uh, the resources available will not allow to offer the program to the universe of individuals who would be needy uh, and, uh, you know, who should be potential beneficiaries. So think about an NGO who has a certain budget. They can only, you know, hire 200 teachers. This will not cover the entire nation, okay? So when you have these limited resources, what is a fair way of allocating them, okay? If you knew ex ante, who is neediest and who would benefit the most, you could say the fairest way is just to target this smaller group. But in many cases, we have some notion that all of this population would need the resources, but who really will benefit the most and needs them the most is very hard to measure. So in these cases, randomization could even be a fair way of deciding who gets the teachers because the alternative, let's be honest, in many cases has been, you know, just uh, preferential treatment by people who are maybe better connected to local authorities or something like that. Okay. So that's one answer to your ethics question. Another is that in many cases, what we try to do is not to leave out a a certain group of people uh, from the program forever, okay? What we try to do is to phase it in so that the order in which you get to receive the benefit is random. So uh, again, even in large scale, evaluations, the government will say, I have one or two years to implement this program at scale. Let's say I want to give uh, transfers to poor families. You know, I have some administrative capacity constraints. I cannot start with the entire country one day to the next. So I will roll this out over the course of 12 months. And then uh, you ask, who's going to go first? 
if you're willing to randomize, then you can simply compare those families that get it first, those families that get it last, and that will allow you to uh, estimate the impact without leaving anyone uh, without the service for good. So these are all strategies that are adopted to minimize the chance that, uh, in fact, uh, um, you know, we leave out uh, needy people uh, from programs that uh, are beneficial. So there is no uh, general answer. Uh, as much as possible, we'd like to mimic uh, the scenario where uh, people are not aware that this is being evaluated, uh, that this is a, an experiment uh, or a policy trial, and where they behave as they would in their normal life. Mm -hmm. And. Eliana, at Bocconi University, you're the scientific director of LEAP, the Laboratory for Effective Anti-Poverty Policies. With LEAP, do you employ the same method? So we... Uh LEAP has a broad mission, which is uh, to rigorously use empirical research to inform um, policy design. And uh, a lot of the research that we do uh, is of this kind, that is, uh, um, you know, impact evaluation uh, when possible with these uh, randomized controlled trials. Uh, we also do sometimes research that is not experimental and that relies on, uh, um, you know, of natural policy changes that governments have implemented in the past or on other evaluation methodologies that you can apply even when you don't randomize who receives the program. So this is one of the methods that LEAP uses. I would say the most frequently used, but not uh, um, exclusively, uh, the, not the only one. A reoccurring theme of your work is the educational role of mass media in developing countries. Most recently in Nigeria, you used an MTV show to assess the power of television to affect thinking and behavior around sex and HIV. Can you tell us uh, how that experiment was conducted? Yes, sure. Uh, so this is uh, work that I've done uh, joint with uh, Abhijit Banerjee and Victor Orozco uh, and in collaboration with the World Bank and with MTV International. So the idea here was to um, try and measure uh, impacts of this uh, educational TV series called Shuga. Uh, in Nigeria, but their target, uh, the target of uh, the MTV Foundation that produces it, is uh, to uh, inform people about how to prevent transmission uh, and how to treat HIV. Uh, also, changing uh, stigma and attitudes towards uh, HIV positive people. So uh, what we wanted to do was precisely to measure whether these objectives were achieved. How did we do the evaluation? Of course, we couldn't do it the moment that this series went on TV and everybody watched it because then we wouldn't have our control group. We wouldn't have a group of people who had not been exposed to the show. So we had to generate this uh, exogenous exposure to the TV series, meaning that it was beyond your control and your choice. And the way we did it is that we set up some mini movie theaters, if you wish. So we rented community centers and, uh, you know, uh, large uh, rooms in schools and so on to uh, project the series so we we brought our own projectors, we had the series on DVD, and then we invited people from the neighborhood, young people aged 18 to 25, to come and join us during the weekend to watch this series. And uh, we selected some uh, neighborhoods in urban and peri-urban areas of southwest Nigeria where during these uh, meetings we were screening sugar, but in another group of neighborhoods, we had the same meetings and we showed a different TV series that had zero educational content. So it was still about, you know, glamorous lifestyle and uh, fun and all of that, but no, um, no information about HIV. Okay. 
and and that was the approach to then go back interview everyone who had been in these uh, screening uh, meetings and uh, after eight months see how their knowledge their behavior and their choices had been affected so uh, did you observe changes in behavior in those who were exposed to sugar so yeah we we saw some striking effects on certain dimensions and some disappointing uh, results on mm. others no the the things that worked very well were in terms of knowledge and attitudes around the HIV we measured how much people knew about uh, sources uh, of uh, contagion, how to treat it, how to get tested, how often, and all of that. And clearly, the the ones that had been exposed to these educational series knew more. They were also more tolerant. They held less prejudices against HIV-positive people. Very mm. importantly, they went uh, to get tested about twice as uh, frequently as the people who had uh, the placebo TV series. Okay, So testing rates are quite low among young people in Nigeria, and this uh, exposure basically doubled those rates. We also saw that uh, they must have somehow adopted less risky sexual behaviors because uh, the um, incidence of chlamydia, which is a, a sexually transmitted disease uh, that we tested for, uh, wo went down by about uh, half uh, for women uh, exposed to the show. So this is an indication that the, the interactions they had were either with the people you know, who were uh, less uh, contagious or that these women were um, using some way of protecting, protecting themselves during uh, sexual intercourse. So all of this, uh, the reduction in risky sexual behavior and uh, the increase in testing and HIV awareness was very good news. Um, what was quite disappointing was that one of the messages of the show in the sense that, you know, it kept coming up was the importance of uh, wearing condoms um, for men uh, and uh, condom take up did not change at all. Okay. We don't see that people exposed to sugar were any more likely to buy them or use them. Okay. Which tells us that either there was some resistance or something else prevented uh, this effect from being measured. The explanation we gave ourselves is that precisely because this group of people had switched to safer uh, sex, maybe they felt less of a need to wear a condom. And uh, let me tell you what also what safer sex means in this context. Uh, um, a non-negligible non -negligible fraction of people has more than one concurrent partner. And this is a factor that uh, was portrayed in the show as uh, increasing potentially risk. Um, and uh, what we find eight months after the show is that the people who watch Sugar are less likely to report concurrent partnership and also have fewer concurrent partners. So maybe because they knew that they had, uh, you know, become safer in the sense maybe of sticking to, uh, to one main partner, they felt less of a need to wear condoms. But I would say that this was, uh, you know, the not so positive uh, aspect uh, of our findings. Uh, everything else seems to have worked really well. Well, all told, it sounds like there were some very positive results. And how would you explain this sugar effect? Was it a case of following new role models or of acquiring new information and getting new ideas thanks to the show? Uh, I think it's a combination of uh, all these things. And uh, that's somehow the reason why uh, the policy world is now considering these entertaining approaches to uh, behavior change. Okay. 
Think mm-hmm. about a traditional information campaign where you go to people and you say, hey, if you want to avoid uh, being infected, you have to do ABC. Uh, this has not been very successful, especially around the HIV. Uh, millions have or billions have been spent on these campaigns with the uh, Um, disappointing results. And one of the reasons uh, these types of campaigns are not super effective is that people don't like to be told what they should do, okay? And uh, um, psychologists have studied this and uh, have explained that uh, the moment we realize we're being lectured, uh, we Uh, raise some barriers. Uh, We filter the information. Counter-arguing is a lot less frequent if you're following a a fun program than if you're following a lecture. And uh, and so what's happening is that when I see this character, I do see um, how they behave. So there is information about uh, things that they do. Uh, You know, where do they go to get tested? How is it done? Uh, But I also uh, see someone that I feel close to me or that I care about uh, uh, getting into trouble, maybe because uh, they weren't cautious enough. And then this allows me to learn from them uh, through this vicarious experience that I didn't uh, experience myself. I don't have to pay the costs firsthand, but through the character I learn. Okay, so all of these mechanisms are mechanisms from learning for learning from other people's experiences through identification, through uh, role modeling, as you said, and finally through exemplification. If the program is good, it will also show step by step how you get in trouble, how you get out of trouble, what strategies you want to rely on for coping. And so people don't feel overwhelmed like, oh, how do I go about this? They have a clear agenda in front of them that's been laid out by a character in a series and not by a teacher. And some years before the Nigerian project, you investigated the possible impact of Brazilian soap operas called novellas upon democratic f- demographic features uh, such as birth rate and frequency of divorce. Did, did you use the same approach as in the sugar study? Uh, we didn't because we were actually, we couldn't. We were looking mm. at the past, okay? So th- that project came about because uh, when discussing fertility transition in Brazil and how the country could go from like a, a total fertility rate of six kids uh, in 1960, which means, you know, a woman would have six kids over the course of her lifetime, to three kids in 1990. So this is, you know, a, an extremely sharp decrease. Uh, one of the stories we heard, which came from some qualitative uh, study done by anthropologists, was that uh, um, a contributing factor had been soap operas showing small families on television. And uh, so what we wanted to do was to give some quantitative evidence around this. Is it true that this contributed to uh, reducing fertility, you know, these seeing small families on screen or not. And since this had already happened, because we wanted to look at the decades from 1965 to 1990, we had to rely on existing data. And uh, the way we could separate the effect of the program from anything else that had happened over this period was to exploit the features of uh, signal receptions around the countries uh, that depended on when antennas had been placed and where, okay? So we got data on where the antennas were at each point in time, and we looked using census data on, you know, the kid, the number of births that women had in every single year. We looked mm. at whether the year after this signal of Globo and the novellas arrived in a given municipality, the fertility rate stayed the same or dropped. Okay, And we found that it actually dropped. So after Hmm. watching these programs, women and families were choosing to have fewer children. But this is an example of an evaluation strategy where 
because we couldn't randomize, the thing had already happened, we're using this staggered expansion of the network across areas and over time to get at the same question, that is, what was the impact of exposure to these programs? Eliana, why is uh, edutainment that you've mentioned so powerful? So I do think that, you know, some of the elements we discussed related to um, the ability to uh, convey information in a simple form that doesn't require you to be literate or highly educated uh, are responsible for the impact. So think of these novellas, you know, in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, literacy rates in Brazil were quite low, and yet everybody could follow uh, these uh, programs, okay? The government was subsidizing the purchases of TV sets so that everybody could watch TV. <laughs> I, I think the contributing factors are all related to who you manage to reach and how they pay attention because uh, they they feel that this is not uh, trying to manipulate them, but uh, that this is part of what they do to have fun. And, yes, uh, it's still entertainment. Yes, exactly. Eliana, you used the experimental approach to raise the aspirations of immigrant students in Italy. Can you tell us about that? Yes, we, uh, together with Michela Carlana and Paolo Pinotti, we uh, implemented a program in middle schools in Italy uh, that was targeting uh, immigrant uh, students with high potential. So these were high performing uh, students from immigrant families. And uh, uh, what the program did was uh, to um, enroll them in uh, a, a series of meetings uh, that happened after school with uh, counselors. And uh, these meetings uh, informed them about potential options in uh, choosing high school trucks, uh, about uh, the types of jobs that they could have coming out of different types of high schools. And also uh, the meetings uh, kind of uh, worked uh, to make these good and high achieving student more self-confident that if they had done well so far, they could do well in the future. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, this uh, program uh, contributed to changing students' choices uh, and uh, not sending them always to um, uh, vocational school, as they were sometimes doing uh, in the absence of our program, but uh, also allowing them to choose more demanding and more ambitious uh, uh, tracks like the uh, technical schools or the liceo, the academic track in Italy. During her speech at the opening of the last Bocconi academic year, the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, hinted to something similar, a project called TOP, a tutoring online program. What was this program all about and what effects did it have? This is a program that's actually still ongoing. We are uh, currently implementing the second uh, year. Uh, we are currently implementing it for the second year. It's uh, uh, also joined with the Michela Carlana. And it's a program uh, that was born last year during the pandemic. Uh, in spring, we realized that uh, uh, many students were at risk of lagging behind uh, because of distance learning, especially if their families couldn't uh, help uh, with homework or with, you know, uh, helping during the morning to connect and follow classes. So we wanted to try and uh, uh, minimize uh, the negative consequences of the lockdown on these vulnerable students. And what we did was we asked um, volunteer university students from three universities, mostly uh, in Milan, uh, Bocconi, Bicocca and uh, State University of Milan, if they were available to uh, vo voluntarily tutor uh, these needy students uh, 
online. So basically connecting through Zoom, Meet or whatever platform uh, for three hours a week and help them with homework. Okay. And uh, what we did was that uh, uh, we uh, offered this opportunity to the school principals of all Italian middle schools. We told them, if you want, send us a list of which students from your school may need this program, and we will do our best to give them a tutor. If we have more demand than uh, the tutor uh, we can uh, support and uh, supply, then we will run a lottery. And, uh, and that's what we did. So here comes the randomization in the sense that uh, out of all the children who requested a tutor, about half got the tutor and the other half didn't because we didn't have enough resources to cover everybody. And then by comparing the uh, performance in a test as well as the, you know, uh, well-being of these students uh, in a survey where we asked them uh, how they had been during the past months and so on, we measured uh, the impact. And we found quite striking effects. We found that these, uh, just with the, uh, a little over five weeks of tutoring on average, these students were doing much better on um, standardized tests in maths, Italian, and English. They were also um, less depressed and um, happier. Their teachers said that they were a lot better following classes compared to the students who didn't get the tutor, and also uh, that their performance in class had improved. So we, we took these very positive results from the first evaluation, and on the basis of them, we have launched the program again this year, this time for the whole school year, so it's still ongoing, and for more students and thanks to the generous, uh, the generosity of these uh, university volunteers who, you know, every week connect uh, and help uh, these younger students, uh, we hope there will be uh, positive effects uh, on um, academic performance, but also the mental health and psychological well-being of these students by the end of the year. Well, Eliana, I want to thank you very much for joining me, and I hope you keep up the excellent work, and I'd love to speak with you again to learn more about how your results are unfolding. Thank you, David. I'm David Wayne Callahan, and this has been Clarity in a Messy World, a podcast from Bocconi University in Milan. Thanks for listening. You can find references from this episode in the podcast notes. To be notified when new episodes come up, Subscribe to Clarity on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or Spreaker.